Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and we start with question number one from Bill Bowman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what consultation it undertook with HMRC regarding any potential negative impact of diverging tax bans and rates from the rest of the UK. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish Government and HMRC have and continue to work closely to implement the income tax powers devolved in the Scotland Acts 2012 and 2016. The Scottish Income Tax implementation projects will ensure that HMRC systems will be adapted to accommodate income tax policy as agreed by the Scottish Parliament. HMRC have been clear that they will be able to implement the Scottish Government's proposed income tax policy proposals for 2018-19. Bill Bowen. Thank you. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As the SNP Deputy Commons Leader Kirsty Blackman pointed out, Scots don't give two hoots about independence. However, they do care about the SNP's new tax bans that could see Scottish pensioners pay hundreds of pounds extra just to access their pension savings. Is the Cabinet Secretary happy that his budget will reduce the quality of their hard-earned retirement? Cabinet Secretary. You know, the, the Tories were, we want to talk about the Constitution briefly. First of all, they were against devolution, then they were for devolution. They were against tax raising powers, now they're for tax raising powers. But just don't use those tax raising powers, is the current position of the Conservative uh, Party. Uh, the budget that I have proposed ensures that Scotland will become the lowest tax part of the United Kingdom for a majority of taxpayers uh, in Scotland and will also result in a tax reduction for a majority of taxpayers as well, whilst also raising resources for our valued public services and giving the best deal anywhere in the United Kingdom. And in terms of the uh, specifics, it is the case that in setting out the use of our uh, tax powers it delivers a, a fairer country. Uh, but there are some areas, uh, such as the pension arrangements, that we wouldn't have had uh, control over. That remains at Westminster uh, relief and interpretation. But I make the point, in designing a system based on uh, a progressive approach, that means even those who are taking out a lump sum from their pension will also be treated in a fair and progressive fashion. And for those pensioners with that lower amount will also en enjoy the benefits of a progressive taxation system. Yeah. Kenneth Gibson. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that being able to set our own tax bans and rates allows the SNP government the flexibility to help protect Scottish public services from damaging Tory cuts to Scotland's budget and at the point of devolution, which Bill Bowman has clearly missed, is that we do what is best to suit Scotland's needs rather than stick with a one-size-fits-all solution, which some Tories would dearly love to impose at the behest of their bosses in London, regardless of the adverse impact on Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding Officer, Kenny Gibson is exactly right. Absolutely. What this Scottish Government... What this Scottish Government is able to do because of the powers that we have under devolution is to take a 211 million pounds real term cut to our resource budget for 1819 and invest in our public services by delivering on the key tests that I set out for income tax and policy, which includes using the system to deliver a more progressive taxation system, protect lower income earners, protect and invest in the economy and also invest in our public services turning a real terms reduction at the hands of a right-wing Brexit-mad UK government into real terms growth for Scottish public services. Question number two, Dean Lockhart. Uh, th thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the latest Scottish Fiscal Commission forecast for economic growth. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay. The Scottish Fiscal Commission forecast for economic growth underline the fundamental strengths in our economy. Economic growth is forecast to continue and employment will rise further with earnings growth forecast to match that in the UK. However, the forecasts also highlight the negative impact that Brexit will have and the challenges that Scotland faces from a declining working age population. The draft budget sets out a package of measures to support the economy, unlock innovation and drive up productivity. 
Dean Lockhart. Thank, thank you for that response. Let me remind the Cabinet Secretary that the Fiscal Commission is forecasting the economy will grow at less than 1% for each of the next four years, a fraction of the growth expected for the rest of the UK. The Fraser of Allender have said that such low trends in economic growth for Scotland have not been witnessed in 60 years. Predictably, the Cabinet Secretary blames Brexit, but he knows the economy under the SNP has underperformed for the past decade, well before Brexit. So my question is this. Given the SNP's abysmal track record and the dire economic outlook, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with leading organisations across Scotland that it is now time for a change in economic policy, that the SNP's 4 i economic policy is not working and that Scotland needs a new direction in economic policy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, presiding officer, well, <laughs> I think the, the enthusiasm for the, for the Tories about to, to dissipate uh, shortly. Can I point out that Dean Lockhart went straight from the SFC uh, forecast to the FEI forecast. Uh, the Fraser of Allender Institute forecasts for economic growth are actually far higher uh, than the SFC forecast, and for that matter, so is the EY forecast for Scotland's economy, all higher than the SFC forecast, which arguably have been seen as quite uh, conservative uh, and cautious. I would also gently point out, I don't think it's the, I think the uh, Scottish Government's interventions in the economy and business are strong, but surely the UK government has to take some responsibility for the economy. Indeed, they argue they have overall responsibility for the economy. I would argue it's the UK economic model that is failing the people of Scotland. And just a few interventions that I propose to make in the budget. Extra support for business rates, the most generous package of business rates relief uh, ever. More around innovation and skills and manufacturing and resourcing uh, the Building Scotland Fund and capitalising the Scottish National Investment Bank, doubling the support for city deals. All of this is great for Scottish investment, Scottish productivity, Scottish innovation and of course all put at threat by the reckless approach of the UK government when it comes to Brexit and the impact that it will have according uh, to the Fiscal Commission on Scotland's economy. Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you, and I remind the Chamber of my role as Parliamentary Liaison Officer for the Economy. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware that a key reason the Scottish Fiscal Commission gives for Scotland's low economic growth forecast is as a result of our projected population profile as a consequence of the impact of Brexit on Scotland's economy. In particular, given that the Fiscal Commission's view that Scotland's economy has already grown at capacity and needs more working age people in order to expand, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that the views of the Fiscal Commission are further evidence of the damage that the hard Tory Brexit will do to Scotland's economy? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, I, I would I agree with that. And the Conservatives have found the Conservatives, I hear the Conservatives chortle that no one else agrees with that. E even wiser Tory ministers are coming to the conclusion that Brexit, a hard Brexit and a no deal Brexit uh, may well be profoundly damaging to the UK economy. So in turn, of course, it would be damaging uh, to Scotland's uh, economy. It is right that the more powers we have, the more we can engage and make the right decisions uh, for Scotland. But specifically in relation to the working age population, it is true to say that the Fiscal Commission identified this as a major challenge. And we can only tackle it properly if we have the powers to do so and the flexibility to rise uh, to that challenge. But I point out gently again uh, that many have reported the economic impact uh, on, of Brexit on Scotland, an economic negative impact of up to £11 billion a year uh, from 2030, impacting on at least 80,000 fewer jobs uh, over the next decade. New information, new analysis from the Financial Times also shows uh, that the vote to leave the EU is already having an impact on the UK economy at around, surprisingly, £350 million a week. Right. Wasn't that the figure that the Tories would be uh, investing in the, the NHS if Brexit uh, had uh, occurred? That's the cost right now of this Brexit mishandling, and we could do so much more if we weren't wedded uh, to that UK mismanagement of our economy and these negotiations. Yeah, yeah. Alice Cole-Hamilton. 
Presiding officer, as the Cabinet Secretary has just articulated, one of the biggest economic issues facing the country is the impact from the UK's withdrawal from the European Union, something my party still passionately opposes. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that as the Scottish Government's existing economic strategy from 2015 is developed and updated, it is essential to take account of and, where possible, address the new and emerging challenges arising from Brexit as a living document that we must keep revisiting? Cabinet Secretary. I think it's a fair commentary to say that should our economic strategy uh, be uh, developed and continue to evolve in light of events, of course it should, and that's why there are so many positive economic interventions uh, in our budget so, budget, so that no matter, uh, no matter the uh, challenges that are thrown at us, we can invest in the people and the skills uh, of Scotland to grow our economy, tackle uh, productivity, uh, but crucially in terms of that working age population issue, be able to have the right tools to ensure that we have that working population that supports our economy as well. And of course, it will have to adapt in light of circumstances. Question number three, Adam Tompkins. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason in its draft budget spending on equalities is being increased by 12%. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Thank you, President Officer. The increase in the equality budget for 2018-19 demonstrates the value ministers place on creating a fairer Scotland by tackling prejudice and discrimination eh, and supporting a more equal and inclusive society where human rights are central. The Scottish Government is firmly committed to progressing equality as demonstrated through our funding of over 220 separate projects and supporting the ambitions, aims and actions in our Race Equality Action Plan, Fairer Scotland for Disabled People Delivery Plan and the Equally Safe Strategy. Increased resource for 2018-19 will also support programme for government commitments, legislation and other strategic work, including British Sign Language, Social Isolation and Loneliness and Human Rights. Adam Tompkins. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. As they, at the same time that the Equalities Budget is going up, and the Cabinet Secretary alluded to this in her answer a few minutes ago, the Social Justice and Fairer Scotland Budget is being increased fourfold, from £7 million to just shy of £28 million. What steps is the Cabinet Secretary taking to ensure that taxpayers will get value for money, and in particular that this, that this spending will be effective? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I would have thought, uh, given that we're at the start of a, a new year, that uh, Mr Tompkins and the Tories would have perhaps uh, had some cause for reflection that given continuing Westminster austerity and the threats imposed by Brexit, that they would have welcomed this government's increased commitment to advancing equality uh, and tackling inequality in all its forums. And I would have hoped that he would have welcomed the increase in the equality budget uh, and indeed the substantial increase uh, in the fairer uh, Scotland uh, budget um, and I can assure Mr Tompkins that we will indeed uh, ensure uh, that maximum value uh, for money uh, is obtained. We have a full range of commitments around the implementation of the British Sign Language, uh, commitments around family reunion uh, crisis grant funding uh, to uh, help uh, mitigate against some of the uh, disastrous decisions uh, in the UK government's uh, immigration and asylum uh, process. Uh, we want to support uh, civic society, produce a bill of rights on human rights, uh, and we will uh, in the very near future be launching uh, our draft consultation on our social isolation uh, and loneliness strategy and will indeed want to fund uh, actions uh, flowing uh, from that, as well as the implementation of the Gender Representation and Public Boards Bill and our ongoing commitment uh, to an equally safe uh, delivery plan. Pauline McNeill. Would the Cabinet Secretary agree that to address the gender gap for women and girls in minority ethnic communities, that it would be helpful to disaggregate the information so that the data is a bit clearer as to what the priority should be to tackle gender-based equality in areas such as prejudice-based bullying or underemployment gaps? Uh, yes, President Officer, I do agree that there is an importance for good, accurate, uh, full uh, information. Uh, the government recently published uh, last year our uh, quality evidence strategy, uh, which is about uh, looking in particular at our uh, priorities around uh, race equality, but also the issues of intersectionality uh, and understanding uh, issues in greater depth, uh, particularly around uh, women and girls. And the advisory group on women and girls will be particularly uh, interested in this area. If 
there are specific gaps uh, in information that Ms McNeill uh, would wish to correspond uh, or meet with me about. I would be happy uh, to do so about that. We've got um, a good record on gathering evidence and pursuing the links between evidence policy uh, and budgetary spend. Uh, but of course, we want to continue to uh, evolve our process uh, for maximum impact. Question number four, Gail Ross. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government how many probationer teachers there will be in the academic year 18-19. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, the application process for probationer teachers for the academic year 2018-19 is still ongoing. The total number of applications will be known in March. Gail Ross. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Teacher recruitment poses a challenge to many remote and rural areas, including my own constituency of Caithness, Sutherland and Ross. Can you tell me what the Scottish Government is doing to ensure that trainee teachers are allocated to these areas during their probation period and what guidance and training is given to the schools to ensure that they are equipped to train them? Cabinet Secretary. President officer, the Government continues to provide £37 million to support the teacher induction scheme, which includes funding for mentoring and support for all probationer teachers on the scheme. This includes funding for preference waiver payments and students taking up this option are prioritised for allocation to remote and rural authorities, such as those in Ms Ross's constituency, uh, during their probationary year and benefit from an additional payment of up to £8,000. Through our education reforms, we will take steps to ensure that initial teacher education prepares students to enter the profession with consistently well-developed skills to teach key areas such as literacy, numeracy and health and well-being and to provide the support to schools to ensure that the training and induction experience is of value to individual candidates. In the data published just before Christmas, the number of post probation of teachers in employment uh, has now reached 88%, which is the highest level on record as a consequence of the actions of the government. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cabinet Secretary, you mentioned at the Education and Skills Committee meeting on the 20th of December that whilst there was an improvement in probationary applications, there was a lower than expected retention rate of qualified teachers. For 2017, official statistics showed that at the start of the year, 4, 000, around 4,000 teachers who had been registered at the beginning of the year were not registered at the end of the year. Uh, can the Cabinet Secretary tell us what percentage of the total reti retirements were teachers leaving the profession? What percentage of the numbers were retirements? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I can't give Mr Mundell that figure uh, just now, but uh, I'm happy to uh, confirm it to him in writing. Uh, what I think is welcome at this stage is the fact that we have seen an increase in teacher numbers in our classrooms of 543 in this academic year. That's a tremendous boost to the delivery of education in our classrooms, and the government is committed to working with our initial teacher education providers to make sure we continue that good progress in the years to come. Question number five, Lewis MacDonald. To ask the Scottish Government by what date the National Trauma Network will be fully operational. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. The Scottish Government is working with NHS Scotland to deliver a major trauma network in Scotland. This work remains on schedule with the National Implementation Plan agreed by the Scottish Trauma Network Steering Group last month. This sets out plans for the phased delivery of the Scottish Trauma Network over five years to 2022. Lewis MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. She will recall that a year ago, Dr Catherine Calderwood, the Chief Medical Officer, concluded that new trauma services in Aberdeen and Dundee would be operational in 2017, and I quote, subject to funding and workforce and in line with nationally agreed priorities. Given the timescale she's indicated today, can she tell us whether the new target uh, timescale is a result, instead of in the place of that target of 2017, is it that a result of issues with funding uh, or with workforce or with nationally agreed priorities? Cabinet Secretary. Well, the implementation plan remains the same. Uh, Lewis MacDonald will be aware that an extra £5 million was uh, given in 2017-18 to enable improvements to accelerate. Uh, funding was provided to deliver a 24-7 trauma desk and life-saving equipment in all Scottish Ambulance Service vehicles. Work was undertaken in Tayside and Fife to pilot the trauma triage tool, which will ensure severely injured patients get to the right hospital as quickly as possible. Funding of £10.2 million revenue in 2018-19 will allow implementation of centres uh, in the major trauma centres in Dundee and Aberdeen, which meet the agreed minimum requirements, which will be operational during
during 2018. So I'm sure Lewis MacDonald will be um, uh, pleased that the Dundee and Aberdeen centres are uh, proceeding as was outlined previously. Thank you. And that 